items kind of scattered throughout, funerary mortuary items kind of scattered throughout. If you have any questions, just ask. So it's pretty much at your pace and take as long as you want to. So okay. no time limits. There's a few things back in here, kind of like a little overflow. Back on that side is my storage stuff, so yeah. I'm an empath and a couple of my friends are actually empaths and uh, going to antique shops sometimes or it's going to like click with a certain item, you click with the energy off of it. Uh, some items are donated, um, like that 666 Bible is donated. Um, and some things are loaned, like the Charlie doll back here, the ventriloquist company. Uh, back here in the red chair. <laughs> and then of course in the back there's some haunted dolls in the back of the room too. This Saturday, hopefully my friend Antonio is making up, uh, he's a lay exorcist, he's trained to become an exorcist, he's a demonologist right now. We have a mutual friend, Jason Love. He lives in uh, Scotland. Um, these two items, the uh, mask, the uh, hand puppet, and everything on this middle shelf, and the Congo mask that's hanging on the wall, those are all from Scotland, from Jason Love's uh, collection. Different things like that. Antonio is going to be bringing, I think, two or three items this Saturday. And my friend Kerry's supposed to be bringing me two or three items this Tuesday. So we're always adding. We're yeah. Always adding stuff. Kind of jealous. Yeah. Zach Bagans just started his museum. Of course, he's got the money, you know, to get stuff. He ended up getting Charlie Charles Manson's dentures. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> and he's got like Dr. Kevorkian's van. <laughs> um, he bought um, this cauldron off this old lady who had flowers in it, and the young son knew where the cauldron came from, so he contacted Zach Bagans. And turns out, you ever heard of the serial killer uh, uh, Ed Gein? Uh, yeah. Wisconsin, multiple movies based Texas, off Texas Chainsaw of Massacre oh, yeah, based yeah, off yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, he bought the cauldron he used to bake the body parts in. Oh. So he's got that out there. I'm like, I'm glad things like this are getting preserved. Gosh dang it, I want one of them. <laughs> There's an old doctor's chair in there. To your left. Yeah. Then, that and uh, got a postcard signed by Charlie Manson up there on top. Oh. Then that little vial of dirt right down here to the right, that little corner shelf thing. That's from the front yard of John Wayne Gacy's house. I'll write this down for you if you want to check out our footage. We do our own YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I saw that the Paranormal Quest. I saw the episode uh, Finding Annie. So oh, I've seen that, that one? before. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's. I haven't. Yeah, she oh. hasn't though. Well, you're just to remind us. <laughs> it's kind of nice getting to meet people that have seen it and, you know, kind of 
helps assure some of the research you do is kind of getting out there for folks. Uh, to see like the, the effort you put into like finding her grave and stuff, like in the libraries and stuff. I just wish the Ancestry had the dog one, uh, the date right. It wouldn't have taken so long. They oh. had February 12th, 1956, when all in all she died in 1966. Yeah, he just found the, the portrait in a like a flea market and it, it, it drew him to it. So he went and found out where she was buried and everything. Was found out her name and everything. Did going she over die like, of just like natural causes? From what I've gathered so far, yeah. Going over all the, like the microfilm and the libraries and stuff. Took a while. <laughs> yeah, so I think that was a cool thing for you to do. A lot of effort into that sort of thing. So now when I get new pictures and I... Uh, tongue-in-cheek look in the back and see if the names are there and I'm thinking please don't be on there because it'll be another two years of finding you. <laughs> <laughs> buried, buried in Brook Cemetery in Wellsburg and uh, Dave sent me a video uh, FaceTime he's like hey guess where we're at and I'm like I see a sunset Dave I don't know where you're at. He says well we're visiting Annie and he showed me a picture of her grave and he says let's try something and normally we uh, we, we don't do a lot of uh, flashlight evidence you know we use flashlights to communicate but this one he just turned on and didn't loosen and put it against your gravestone. And I sat here and had my phone leaning up against my incense burner here and I used this pendulum right here. So he could see it, he and Ryan could see it, and I could see what they're doing here. So I asked, <clears throat> Annie, if you're here, can you make this spin counterclockwise? And it started going counterclockwise. And I said, if you can, can you leave here and go where Ryan and Dave were at and turn the flashlight off? And then eight, ten seconds later, huh. flashlight turned off. So we were, and of course Dave's like, because Dave doesn't give a lot of clout, and we we really don't as a team because it's it's very controversial using flashlights and stuff like that. And of course it got dark because the only light they had was the flashlight, and you just hear Dave go like, really, you know? <laughs> so it was pretty awesome. Of course, you know, something like that happened. You're not actually recording it. Yeah. But it was an amazing personal experience, and there's been other times we've actually made communication with her via the pendulum dousing or uh, like proximity meters and stuff like that. So, uh, see, what is um, the most active thing in this museum, I guess, other than Annie? Probably the cap in the electric chair. Yeah. Is that, would you say, the most negative thing in here is the cap? Oh, the cap in here. Yeah. I'd say so. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever get worried bringing, like, for any of this stuff to become rooms? It didn't really bother me much. I think there's a mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, didn't you say before that some people get sick when they come in here? How often does that happen? A couple times it's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So they like report, they they left, and uh, weird stuff happened to them, anything like that? I don't know if anything have weird happened to them. I know they got sick, nauseous, and went and left the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, brother, took the picture down there too. Mm -hmm. ah, so that is, that's cool. I watched the episode where you guys tried to like recreate on the same night. <laughs> we were trying to, then all of a sudden we started to get footsteps and banging and just said, well, looks like this is going to go from an experiment to an investigation pretty quick. Yeah.
guess is as good. Yeah, as how much? How much do you know about the Mothman? Not a lot. Have you ever read uh, it, the Mothman prophecies by John Keel? I watched the movie. <laughs> okay. I much honestly, I wish book. I had the attention span for books. <laughs> hmm. No, I, it's a fascinating, you know, occurrence. But mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not too, uh, too up to date on that. Okay, I do a, a YouTube channel about Mothman. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, I it this way. We got your. Uh, it's a it's a um, YouTube channel that does Mothman content, but also does just random West Virginia stuff, like oh, travel cool. and stuff. What's it called? West Virginia. Uh, Mothman Historian. Moth. Right uh, here, seventy-five videos, hundred twenty-four subs. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Mm, okay, get up, tap the bell, and we'll get updates. Heck yeah. Down there a couple, my first time down there was three years ago, and the second time we went, it was the 50th anniversary or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't go this past year, so it was two years ago was the big anniversary celebration when they had. It was a lot of fun. And then yep. we ended up down there and we ended up uh, going to the uh, to Indy Wee State Park, mm -hmm. ended up meeting a direct descendant of Chief Cornstalk, Lynn Robinson, her Native American name is Fawn. Mm -hmm. So that, and then the same visit, we met the... Uh, I don't know if it's called the CVB down there, the Visitors Bureau, but we end up meeting this really old guy who's like one of the head haunches for like the riverfront and historic stuff. And it's good to see a town that seems like it's trying to conserve history and embracing yeah. tourism. When you went down there, did you just go to the town, Flint Pleasant, or did you go to the TNT area or anything? I think it's go to the TNT area. Actually, my, <coughs> my friend Jason, uh, he's one of the four guys at Paranormal Quest, mm -hmm. the new guy. He put that on one. That vent down there came off one of the TNT silos. What? Which vent? That vent. He said it had blown off into a big briar patch and went and went and got. He put it on loan here. That and that one board that says night and day. That is from the uh, what's it called? It was a huge, huge hospital in Indianapolis. They tore it down, leveled everything, and put condominiums in. And. Uh, Something mid 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 no mid something hospital. And mm -hmm. so there was like eight buildings torn down. All the buildings were probably like a hundred, two hundred some square feet of space and just massive, massive thing. I know when we pulled up next to the property you could barely see on the other side of the property. That's how spacious it was. And all the buildings were connected by under under uh, underground uh, tunnels and stuff like that. But, they left like one, one building up, and they made it like an artisan museum. So. Okay, have you guys ever considered doing a video about the Mothman? We're not against it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's something we've uh, we've talked about trying to investigate one of the buildings down there, but mm -hmm. you know. We tried to investigate the low hotel, but we could never get a definite well, answer out of it. I stayed there. Yeah, we, we did a walkthrough. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful building. Yeah, it is. I like the riverfront. All the I like art, so I like all the murals and stuff. I'm like, I don't want to paint this. <laughs> yeah, really so with pin down, does this ever like just not work for some people? Sometimes. Some I think some people are more charged than others. Uh, my friend John kind of got me up to date on a lot of being an empath. I knew I was sensitive and he uses the term empath, and there's certain types of empaths. He says he's more into like healing, you know, stuff like that, helping people that way. And uh, he says I'm more of a battery, so which makes sense. I can meet people for the first time and know right off the bat if I would ever trust them or not as a friend. Or I'm like, I'm sure you're okay, but I'm not going to trust you ever. No offense, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I can pick up on your energy, her energy, his energy, and energy from people from. That have crossed over so that's just one thing i've come to the area that i'm it's why it's easy to collect for me you know collect pieces that have energy attached to it people ask me like why are you buying that i'm like oh i'm just getting it you know yeah. you tell them why they're just like oh okay you know he's not yeah but <laughs> so. but no yeah i think we'd, we'd be open to it because I really like your channel. It's like one of the best uh, paranormal channels on YouTube. Thank you. I appreciate that.
They have very nice uh, production value, very like documentary style. That's what we wanted to do. We we loved paranormal investigating and we loved documentary documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So we just try to take. Put yeah, and you also include a lot of history and stuff. Yeah, we've gotten some guff from that, but I say, hey, that's how we do it. You know, we want to people to be informed of where we're at. Mm -hmm. You know, not just a quick one minute interview and then okay, let's get back to investigating. Mm -hmm. We like the history. History is important. You know, mm -hmm. you know what what you're doing with your channel, what we're doing with our channel. It's history. You know, yep. It's history being documented. And it, it, it needs to happen or else no, or no one would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did the Mothman video and you needed help or something, you could, uh, like, it'd be cool if I could do, like, an interview thing, you know, how you do interviews and you bring on people yeah. who know about it. Okay. So you could uh, have me on there. That'd be cool. I have to figure out how I get a hold of you. That. But just uh, uh, Twitter and YouTube and my website, which is uh, the Mothman Wiki. Okay, so I just sent it through YouTube. Okay, but um, the the Mothman legend, it it's like a thir it was like a thirteen month legend from November, nineteen sixty six to December nineteen sixty seven, and uh, the creature was like a six to seven foot tall Birdman with ten foot wingspan and red eyes. Right. Uh, the Mothman, the name Mothman comes from the newspaper, so it's not actually like a moth or any way insect like. Yeah. It's it's uh, more like a Birdman. The, the locals call it the bird. And then it became Mothman Didn't through the papers. Didn't show up like a little bit prior to uh, the Point Pleasant sighting, like in Chinston or something. Before I heard someone mentioned that it showed up before this really bad flood that happened around Chinston, West Virginia. Uh, people report a lot of uh, like bird-like creatures before uh, disasters. The, the Mothman case was before the collapse of the Silver Bridge in December fifteenth, nineteen sixty-seven. Yeah. But uh, one thing that you'd be interested in is the witnesses reported to have like a poltergeist activity in their in their homes. Okay. And the TNT area, of course, has uh, tons of activity in it—not just uh, Mothman, but other stuff like UFOs and just paranormal activity. So, yeah. if you wanted to go, I know one the thing. My, my, TNT area. my friend owns the Wells Inn in Sistersville. He's kind of hard to approach sometimes. It depends on what mood he's in. But um, he's just doing his own research about a lot of the Native American stuff. And, mm -hmm. One thing he, the one thing he did find out is that a lot of the tribes loved to hunt in West Virginia during the day. So they would cross the Ohio, from Ohio, to hunt and trap and whatnot. But he said they were terrified of West Virginia at night. Hmm. And so they would literally, at dusk, be hightailing it to the river to cross the river to get back to Ohio. Hmm. And I've always wondered, why would that be? Yeah, John Keel talked about that kind of stuff in the Moth and Prophecies as well. Um, but uh, the TNT area, the, I've heard that there is burial there in the TNT area. Wouldn't surprise me. So there's that, and then of course that it was the, the World War II munitions plant. Yeah. So it's a cool place. And actually, if you go south of, um, it's either south or north of St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. There's a real big power plant down there, a big open area. That all that used to be. Um, Native American fortifications within like 400 square acres, but it was all completely destroyed. They had big earth and wooden like walls and everything around it. They were all destroyed because of the, when they put in the uh, the plant and everything like that. So it's it's hard to tell. I mean, you know, it's hard it's hard to tell. You know, we're all going on down there. Yep, so if you ever uh, plan to investigate that, you know, yeah, man, be cool to. I'll do my do best that. try to get a hold of you. Yep. <laughs> Do a little crossover event. I mean, yeah, it'd be fun. Hmm. A friend okay. of mine was just on that terror in the woods for uh, for, the, for the episode about how he and his uh, grandfather used to go fishing down the center part of West. He's from Brown Summersville, and uh, they had an encounter with uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch. Hmm. Have you thought about uh, extent, uh, extending your paranormal quest kind of stuff from just spirits to you know, I monsters? I mentioned and it here stuff? and there, but it comes down to what we have time for. Mm -hmm. You, know, but you wouldn't be opposed to it? I, w I personally wouldn't be opposed to it. Yeah, yeah. cover the full range, spirit, UFO, I mean, monster. I wouldn't mind starting to bring in some cryptozoology into the museum. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but it's, you know, it's the it archive of the afterlife, so kind of... Well, it also says the National Museum of the Paranormal. Yeah. So I added that to it when I realized, well, I'm also collecting history and mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, museums are meant to evolve. You know, name may be one thing, but things do change. I thought about getting one of those big uh, Bigfoot uh, cement statues 
and do like a little corner display of it. Just something fun for the kids so they can get their picture taken with it. So um, I've seen that you guys are more, a little bit more skeptical in a certain degree. I've seen like, um, well, it's because we yeah. need to be. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, I've seen him like he'll find a noise, then he'll find a source for what that noise could be, like a, another explanation. He'll yeah. he'll go for that, and investigate into that. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Also, you guys are sort of skeptical about certain gadgets, that, like certain things, methods. Yeah, we, guys. we we. I mean, we'll try pretty much anything, but there's certain things that are we feel are kind of made for like yeah. gimmick so in in your experience what do you think the best sort of gadget to use is or the one that you think works the best my favorite yeah or um, just the best ones to use you think rem pods have always come through for us those so are like speaker things with there's, there's a little hockey oversized hockey puck thing that has mm -hmm. the uh green yellow and red and orange light on it that has a little antenna that makes a beep sound you know yep. finding annie what was in front of her case that would have been a uh, rem pod so yep. those you can put them on a table you can put them on steps just a proximity meter uh, creates an electromagnetic field and anything that breaks it yep. it'll sound it off and i like i i've used them before i don't own one i like mill meters hmm. uh, the newer mill meters are nice because you get more for your money uh, you have a built-in k2 meter ambient temperature gauge and yep. the mill meter itself is that k2s are good yeah k2s yeah those ones are good yeah, too. those are the ones you push down and it should yeah, you get the old ones, you got to hold down the whole time. Yeah, I've seen, yeah. like, I wonder what the, the quarter was in there for. I've seen, like, <laughs> the gray one, we have the quarter stuck yeah, in it. we have a couple old the tools. That you have? Yeah, he has, like, a gray one, and it doesn't stay down. We, like, have, we have the old dinosaurs. So, he's the quarter. <laughs> I've seen, like, the quarter. We were playing around with that on the mound a little bit ago. Yeah, we were just in, Mount, like, the Grave Creek Mound. Right. And we just did prison tour. And it lights up for me, but it does absolutely nothing. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, when you're doing any meter, like a K2 or a Mel meter, that if you have your cell phone on, mm -hmm. if you get a text, an update, a mm -hmm. phone call, anything that sends a, uh, you know, charge of electricity, it'll set one of those off. Yeah, I've, I've tried this with like a walkie-talkie. It picks up walkie-talkies yeah. and also picks up uh, microwaves. Yeah, so, so I mean, it, it's it's good, especially if you're in a, out in the middle of a cemetery. Yeah, like where there's no electricity at all. Like but a, it's also good, you can, you can, I mean, you can use it on investigation, but you want to go around and say, okay, this, this, electrical uh, source this is electrical source this fans on you do a, what they call a base reading mm -hmm. so yeah. that way yeah. if you get something where you you, you didn't get a signal at mm -hmm. that can help maybe prove that you're getting something out of the point yeah that's yeah. what i like about well, your your show you kind of like um you don't make the automatic assumption that that's the source you go and try to find out what the source is and if right. you can't explain some the source, people might be that. watching for the first time yeah we yeah. may have someone who's been invested someone watching who's been you know investigating for 10 years but we also, on the other side of the coin, might have had someone watching for the first time who's never been investigating. So mm -hmm. we like to be informational, you know, with them. Teach yeah. a little bit, you know, with what we've Probably. gathered thus far, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just, it's fun. Have you ever considered um, investigating the, the Greenbrier ghost? I'm not sure how you could investigate that. It's kind of like specific, but I've been to the grave. Have you been to the, the grave? I've heard, I got the book. Yeah, I know she did have a one Mothman book. You've got a book by Jeff Wombsley, Mothman Behind the Red Eyes. Yeah, that was donated. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He runs the Mothman Museum. Was that him? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, I only got to meet the one, uh, the bigger guy. Mm -hmm. He always wears the military pants, kind of heavy set. Nice guy. Always sits at the desk when you walk into bay. Mm-hmm. So I've only met him down there. the two times I've gone down. Okay, so you you have a, you've considered it, but you're like not sure to do that yet. Like you, I guess you have a lot to to do, but that's yeah, one of them. It's definitely one thing that we fun to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. <clears throat> yeah, there's that. There's like the Mothman, the uh, Flywoods monster. You heard the Flywoods monster? Yeah. Okay. Actually, I got some of their brochures here. Yeah. I've been talking to the guy down there, setting up a uh, time. He's trying to work it to where PQ can investigate the, the old jail down there in Braxton County. Mm -hmm. But it's full of, like, full of old files right now. And I guess the people down there uh, let the people go in and cut out the bunks to make room for uh, shelving and stuff. So they cut all the old old racks, the old beds out of all the jail cells. Hmm. Like, it's a little bit ridiculous. Okay. So most people just, they don't care or don't have the foresight of preserving history. You know? yeah, they really don't. And and people can make a living with history. 
that's the thing. You know, what I mean, you can make a living with history, <laughs> but you know, but being a conservationist and also taking care of yourself or and or the person's family. You know. mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd recommend some more uh, West Virginia folklore because. Uh, I really like West Virginia folklore, and that's another reason that I really like your channel because you guys focus on West Virginia. So West Virginia a little bit biased there, but West, yeah. West Virginia has a lot. Yeah, <laughs> There's a great lot, state. A lot of history here. Yeah, it'd be cool to involve more uh, West Virginia folklore as well in your stuff. Yeah, so. I think so. Because you do with your videos and with your um, museum here, you focus on a lot of locations and objects, right? Um, there's other things that are just like the stories. You think you could be able to tell? <laughs> is it, I guess, more difficult to tell those kind of stories where it's just the story, just the person, and not related to an object or a location? Because there's um, there's stories like the injured cold story, which is um, a story about a man named Woodrow Derenberger who encountered a mysterious being on the side of the road. So there's stories like that where it's um, some being, but it's not just in a location or with an object. So you know, I've been really hoping somewhere up here in the northern panhandle um, it seems like as of right now with the research that i've been doing here on the side we're kind of void of old folklore and stuff like that it seems to be down the center part of the state hmm. you know what I mean? yeah More... i'm not saying it's not here i just haven't found anything to... yeah because there's like flatwoods is in like near the center and then uh point pleasant's on the very edge near ohio yeah but there's other stuff as well there's um the apple devils, which is like a hairy humanoid creature that's supposed to steal apples. That was in the 60s, and I, don't, I guess that was across the entire state. I don't know if it goes to the Panhandles. Hmm. But um, have you heard the injured cold story, the one I mentioned before? I've heard the name. Hmm. I've heard the name. Because you watched the, the Moth and Prophecies movie, and that's yeah, kind of included that, in that. My little visit, a couple visits down there. <clears throat> the team's here with trying to find funerary mortuary items or haunted items and or both. The tends to soak up a lot of my research time. You know what I mean? It's kind of hard to <coughs> spread out. You know, I do want to spread out. I do want to get some more cryptid type of uh, displays and exhibits here, but I don't really have time to become proficient at it. And when you're not proficient at it, you don't know what to look for. I saw a quick little, there was a, a moment in one of your uh, shows where there was like a noise and you guys looked at each other and then just ran towards the noise. Yeah. And I think that's really good that you guys run towards the noises instead of uh, running away from like other investigators. I think that might have been the old Sanford one. We're actually planning on doing another one here. Hmm, cool. One I know. We have, a little, we have more equipment now. That was probably four or five years ago. <laughs> I know the the one that you're working on right now. I saw that it was going to be like a, a jail in Ohio that you're doing like Looking post production County, on. You guys need to go there. Hmm. Lincoln County Jail. Yeah, it's cool. They do night tours and day tours there. Oh, we were setting up in the rim pub. was going off. We had got there the day of three main historical happenings, and one of them, this guy cut his own throat in the uh, shower, and we had just set up the rim pod, and we're setting everything up, and then we're just going to turn our lights off. We are. Beep, started going off. Yeah. We were there on the anniversary of his death. We were there on the anniversary that the first stone was laid. We were there on the anniversary where um, Hetherington was taken out of his jail cell and taken over to the um, city square and was hanged from one of the uh, electrical poles. So that's because he was uh, he was an ex Marine, but he got into uh, um, like a police officer, a probate, or a prohibition officer. Oh, yeah. And they had a bunch of illegal. They used to call that the uh, Chicago of Ohio, Little Chicago, because mm -hmm. they had all these illegal speakeasies and stuff. And, and uh, he went in uh, to bust up this one uh, bar, and the guy who owned the bar was the ex police officer, ex police chief. And word has it, he thought the police chief was going for his gun. He might have, he might not have been, I don't know. And he shot him dead. Mm -hmm. So they arrested him, took him there to keep him safe from. The townsfolk and the townsfolk broke into the jail, pulled him out of his cell, took him to the city, to the town square, and, and hanged him. So it was like it was like the wild, the wild west in yeah. Newark, Ohio. Yeah, so, it sounds like it. But it's it's a cool place to go. And once in a while they have um, get his get his name. But he was the, remember Jesse in the first Fast and Furious movie. The guy had the white Volkswagen Jetta. Yeah. It's an older one. He he got into doing paranormal investigating once in a while he'll actually do an event over there so you get to meet mm -hmm. him and stuff like that they do a lot they're, they're always pretty busy over there yeah i don't think i've ever heard of that place 
Actually, this Friday, um, tomorrow, um, from 10 to uh, 4, I just started last week doing uh, public uh, public overnights here. So we do private ones are $200, and that's for the private flat rate of the group or whatever. But we're starting to do in public ones where it's $10 a person from 10, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. So um, I normally post it on my Facebook page, but uh, if you guys ever want to come, just check out the, uh, if you go to the website I have, all the way to the bottom of the list, and it says public public paranormal Exp explorations, and there's a Facebook link. You hit click that link, takes to the Facebook page, and that's where I put like the um, postings of the tours and stuff like that. So. Okay. And it's over the public, so if you want to bring friends and family, you know, more yeah. the merrier. What we yeah. do is do a walk through the school, go over some of the hot spots. We end up here, so you investigate not only the school but the museum as well. Does uh, Dave and Ryan ever hang out here in the shop? Oh right? yeah, yeah. No? They they have jobs too. So mm. I've heard before you guys talking about like um, doing like fan meetups or like group investigations where people can come. Yeah. Have you ever have you actually ever done that? Like in that. We did a couple. We, we did a, uh, a contest one time, and because it's kind of when we do an investigation, we like mm -hmm. to keep it very very small. So if we had people that want to come and we have 50 people show up, we, we can't make that an episode. So we tried to make like a contest there, like the 10th person to, to do something or whatever, it gives everyone a chance to do it and then we'll do some kind of like a, a contest. I do, uh, I've been doing uh, conventions here. Yeah. Uh, Grave City Para, uh, Grave City Paracon. Uh, this January 20th I'm doing uh, Grave City uh, Haunted Relic Expo. So it's anyone who has one, two, five, ten, or whatever haunted items, they can bring them in. They can they, they'll rent a booth. The booth pays for the overhead basically, and they can uh, put the history and story behind their haunted items and different things like that. So I'm trying to get that started because you don't you have a lot of paranormal conventions, but you don't have one that really focuses on haunted items. Plus, it gives me something to look for to buy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we go on like a we go on tons of different places, like tons of trips, different places, and I call it my cross county tour, yeah. going across county West Virginia, and she takes me on them, Heck and yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. And this is one of the stops. I try to make videos out of them too, yeah. so I make a video out of your uh, paranormal quest thing or your paranormal uh, museum. That'd be cool, right? Oh yeah, that's fine. I always try to find stuff on the woman in the white veil, and I never, like, even when we go to, like, Mothman Festival and there's so no, many people right. there that, like, look into things. Yeah, I've found stuff about that, like, just generally, but haven't found it in, like, yeah, specifically to West Virginia. specific to it. Because, like, the whole time I was growing up, I always heard, and it's not, it wasn't just our family, it's, like, all the families in, like, little coal towns or old coal towns, coal camps, um, they always talk about the woman in the white veil. And um, even my friend Chad like grew up and he swears that he saw a woman in a white veil in his grandma's house. But it's just like supposed to be this woman who lurks in coal camps and she's dressed in a white dress and she's got a white veil and she like apparently when she looks at you, talks to or when she looks at you, you just kind of like freeze and you get this overwhelming filled dread and then things go back to normal. She just disappears. It's when your adrenaline spiked out the roof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I always try to find stuff about it or ask people if they've heard anything about it and nobody ever seems to know anything about it. That's the it. first time I've heard about it. it. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Especially when it's like something that you've grown up hearing about your whole life. You, you like to try to... I know there's one thing, it's not a lot, not real big around here, but I was always fascinated with it was uh, with the, uh, the Wendigo. Involving that, and I never really. Uh, kind of, I just reminded myself, but I kind of forgot about it for a while. <laughs> I get like ten ideas for here, and I'm like, okay, I gotta focus on this one because this is more practical. Yeah. And I ended up forgetting mm -hmm. about them, and then like a month later, I'm like, oh, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. So. But <clears throat> we grew up in a house that um, they had. A, oh no, the Raven Mocker. What's the Raven Mocker? It's a, it's very similar to uh, a Wendy. It's a Native American evil spirit, basically. Oh. But it can steal the hearts of people who are sick or suffering without breaking the skin. So basically, it's death. 
Yeah. Uh, more than likely be like a figure of death, you know what I mean, stuff like that. But only, uh, only uh, two, two, two men or two people of, uh, of medicine, medicine men, can actually see and prevent it. It's like six, eight foot tall, bird looking thing. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's also like the Thunderbirds, it's another Native American bird creature. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of us, a lot of Native American lore. Mm -hmm. Definitely a prevalent thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Have you, uh, since you're in Moundsville, have you been to the, the Palace of Gold? Once when I was lost. <laughs> I didn't really hang around. Water in. I mean, I don't know. I found like, I don't know what the heck this is. Uh, I want to go. And, uh, Dave's mother, her name's Polly. You know, she's on the Shadow Man picture. Made oh, yeah, I know that. Uh, like in, in Moundsville, like the, the long hallways, the one we went down. Shadow Man hallway. There was like a, a, like a shadowy figure at the end there's of one of the doors. There's a poster of it back there yeah. behind the... Yeah. But his mom took it. His mom took the picture. And, but they did a... Because she used to investigate a lot too. But they did the investigation... Well, it was just her day when he was younger and some of the old members of Mountaineer Paranormal they did. And um, Brian and I wasn't around yet. Well, this cabin was like a two-bedroom cabin, living room and a kitchen and a bathroom. And that's how small it is. But these are, it was probably one of the most oppressive places I've ever been to. Four confirmed deaths, three funerals were conducted in this little cabin. And they were going Native American group. And they said, one, they said it was so bad. They were so creeped out about it, and these are like investigators have been doing it for years. You know, not yeah. You know, and anytime they left to go use the restroom or go outside, they always went out together. That's how joined at the hip they were. That's how terrified they were at this point. One particular time, they went back into the cabin. It was full of smoke. Someone or something. They were the only ones in the cabin. No one else was in there. Had opened the wood burner door, lifted it, and opened it. Open. Open to, like it was trying to suffocate them with some of the smoke. Huh. Like you literally had to pull up and pull open on it. Yeah. It was wide open. No one touched it the entire night. Okay. I just want to ask you different things and ask if you've investigated into them. Uh, have you really looked into UFOs a lot or just uh, basic knowledge? Uh, basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. I haven't really dug too deep into that yet. It's interesting though. Mm -hmm. I would recommend uh, John Keel. Okay. And uh, there's another French UFO investigator who has similar ideas to John Keel. He's pretty good. I think his name is Jacques something. And um, what about the Men in Black? Have you heard about them? Like, I've heard of them. Yeah. They're in, they're, uh, stories about them for not just UFOs, but for all kinds of different things, monsters. I don't think I don't think specifically spirit, but they, people do think of them in that way sometimes, like they themselves are evil. Mm. Possibility. Okay. So you, you've never like went out field investigating UFOs? You might, might have just read a little, a little bit? Read a little bit here and there. Hmm. I want to know, um, do, do you think that um, this stuff, like the, the spiritual stuff and all that stuff, could sort of come from somewhere other than an afterlife? Because I know that you focus on the afterlife and you think that's like the, the best explanation for it. But do you think like other perspectives perhaps, like the uh, these things coming from somewhere else other than afterlife. You mean as in like other dimensions, different things like that? Or yeah, there's different UFOs. There's different things. interpretations like that. Yeah, then for example, what people look at, like shadow people. Some people mm -hmm. believe that they're ghosts. Some people believe they're angels. Yeah, demons. Some people believe they're demons. Some people, some people believe they're aliens. Yeah, there's different interpretations. So there's no. I don't think there's ever going to be a definitive answer on that until someone passes on to the next dimension or the other side. Mm -hmm. But you, you seem uh, pretty convinced on the afterlife part, right? That's your uh, From best my experience and research. Yes, yeah. I would. I would say. I mean, are you open the, to the, the other ideas? The next best thing I would figure, especially with like shadow people and stuff, would be more towards extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. Would be probably the, the next step down from that so far, because from what I've gathered and experienced in my lifetime, evidence-wise. Um, a hereafter or afterlife or whatever, you know, whatever people want to call it, everyone has their own little niche for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think to me, with what I've experienced, what I've researched from people, you know, people's work like the Warrens or Hans Holzer, people, you know, the, the pioneers of investigating, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
a lot of the research gathered supports for me supports my opinion uh, that a lot of it comes from mm -hmm. an afterlife. Yep, fair enough. However, whatever that might be. Yep, fair enough. Uh, it's, what it's, do you, it's kind of a broad statement, though. Mm -hmm. What do, you, what do you think the the reason for electromagnetic stuff being connected to it is? Do you think that an afterlife would, why would it um, <laughs> for me, every, manifest in that way? For me, everything's, you know, us breathing, talking, communicating, processing, mm -hmm. you know, is energy. Yeah. You can't create it nor destroy it, really, you know. It's got to go somewhere. It's either, gonna, in my opinion, it's either going to rest on something, mm -hmm. absorb into something else, mm -hmm. or just stay dormant until someone walks through who has maybe a correlating energy level or correlating characteristic, what we call characteristics maybe, you know, when you meet someone for the first time, for example. Like you guys walked in, I felt comfortable. The other people yeah. have walked in here before and I'm like, I don't feel comfortable with you. I think that transfers over to the other side as well. So that way, hmm. people come in to the, the prison, for example, and say, I talked to Red Snyder today. Hmm. You know, we've made communication with him. So and someone's like, well, when I was here, I didn't get anything from that. So like, maybe he didn't want to talk to you. Yeah. You know, I, I think that definitely transfers over. Who's to say that it doesn't transfer over? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think that uh, the electromagnetic thing, the reason it's picking up is just because, like, this the same sort of energy from an afterlife, you think? I think so. Okay. Or what's remnants of it after it's gone? Like, one okay. thing, I, like an example I give people, if I were to take... Uh, that's good stuff. Hmm. Let's say, hypothetically, this cup had... It's got nails in it. Mm -hmm. Let's say it had water in it. And I poured the water over the desk. Where's the majority of the water going to go? Well, the, <clears throat> the residual aspect of the cup, mm -hmm. or what is left of something after most of it's gone, is the definition of residual. Uh, the residual will be the dampness in the cup and on the desk. Because mm -hmm. the majority of it's going to the, to the floor. So, in theory, when someone lives, it shares emotions, sadness, happiness, fear, I firmly believe that becomes imprinted on, not this per se, but items, atmospheres, mm -hmm. houses, yep, areas. Objects and yeah, locations. Gettysburg. There's no houses. I mean, there's, yeah, there's houses that on, at Gettysburg that aren't on the battlefield necessarily. Yeah. You know, you have atmospheric hauntings. And I believe some of them are residual. They're just uh, clips of what used to be playing over and over again. And if you get there at the right time, the right place, right situation, circumstances, there's a potential that a person can see or at least sense in one way or form or the other. That occurrence. Now you do also have um, what we call intelligent. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Objects. But why is it that some of them are kind of like replay, and then some of them you can talk to? Like some of them would just carry on. For me personally, like um, every day. everyone has their own opinion. Yeah. I believe in a. I, b I believe in pretty much a quad hmm. um, structure. You have angels, you have demons, you have residual energy, and you have intelligent. Nah. Um, energy. Now, so the replay is like leftover and then the other ones are ones that are like... Well, um, basically <clears throat> there's a good possibility mm -hmm. that what we consider residual or consider intelligent might be something good or bad manipulating that occurrence to uh, to reach out to that person to make communication whether that's good or bad. Me personally, I believe anything that's good angelic, divine, whatever, mm -hmm. would not do anything to scare somebody or do anything that is uh, mal malicious. Yeah, malevolent. It, it, right. it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't add up, doesn't make sense. I do believe that <clears throat> anything that's demonic um, will manipulate whatever it can to, for me, I'm Protestant, will trip up mankind, which is what they're meant to do. Anything demonic, evil, uh, wants to maim, discourage, and just be downright, you know, detrimental to the happiness of mankind. So, in most demonic cases you run into, people see a little girl, a little child, and when the person accepts that, oh, that's little, that's little Becky who got hit by a carriage back in the 1800s. It's a possibility. It's a possibility that's what mm -hmm. it is. However, Could be another trick. possibility, it, it's, it's just a... Uh, you know, a, a decoy yeah, a trick. to get you to accept it, right? Once, mm -hmm. once you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. And you got to realize, anything on the other side that's beyond the veil, as, as, li as life as we know it is right now, they're not on our time. Mm -hmm. We're on their time. They don't have aspect of time. Man created 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and all that stuff. 
mm-hmm. you know. So it could be if it's something bad, and you give it a control a foothold in your life, it may be a day, week, month, or a year, or two years, three years down the road, whenever it decides to start inch, inching away at your happiness, different things like that. You know, okay. that's just from my mm-hmm. standpoint. I've so dealt with a lot of demonic cases and different things like that. My some of my family members went through it, and we got them through it. And that's um, what I've gone to college for was church ministries, and I'm going into another school right now for uh, spiritual warfare and demonology. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you think that um, human beings have the capability to determine when something is uh, a good manifestation or when it's a bad manifestation, like when I it's a genuine, intelligent thing we, and when it's a trick? In my opinion, we get that when we're very young. Mm-hmm. I use this term loosely, but when people have to start adulting, mm-hmm. you kind of lose track of that. This gets run around with you, and I don't mean it bad, but people lose that common sense. Mm-hmm. Which, that, that, I'm not meaning that in the cliche manner, you're, you know, but they, they lose that common core of awareness. <clears throat> Some people don't. Some people do. Some people keep maybe 50-40% of it. You know, there's people that are more sensitive. Because you notice, it's obvious, and it's a very, very... Um, old uh, theory and I believe it to be fact that children are more sensitive to the mm-hmm. afterlife as are animals mm-hmm. um, so yeah I mean I think you know I, I think that to be true okay I was just uh, want to know your perspective on that because there are tons of different perspectives if you go into monsters and stuff like because you said you want to branch out into that if you go into that there's tons of different perspectives like some people will think that these things are undiscovered animals and some will think they're interdimensional and some will think that they are spiritual like you were talking about the Native American sort of uh, windigos and stuff. There could be a mixture of everything. Yeah, it could be a, a, a spiritual monster and stuff and suppose that sort of thing. So there's different, people have different explanations and uh, that stuff and people sort of like pick and choose which one they think based on each individual one, you know, like some people think that the UFOs are interdimensional or extraterrestrial or spiritual. So. It's and weird plus, how people from, from my standpoint, choose those. You know, being you know, Christian and Protestant, mm-hmm. um, I think it would be egotistical for mankind to think that human beings are the only thing ever created with the, the capabilities of being intelligent in building and constructing things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, when man, for me, for me, I'm not saying everyone else should think this way, but for mm-hmm. me, you know, if I thought that way, I would be limiting the God that I worship. I would be limiting the entity that I believe, you know, created, in my opinion, he created the Big Bang, he created this, he created that, because for me, it's it's hard for me to, to grasp and put faith into, rather than faith in creation, but put faith into that something came from nothing. Okay. That's just me. But it, but it would be egotistical for mankind to believe that well, there's no such thing as aliens, there's no such thing as cryptids or other mm-hmm. dimensions, because for me, that would be mankind limiting the creator. Yeah. I, pers- you know? I personally think that the aliens would have a little bit more trouble getting here than, like, a, say, an interdimensional thing where they could travel instantaneously. But, really. yeah, do you think the, the overall paranormal has a, a single source or multiple sources? Like, I know you think there's good and evil sources, but do you think it's all a spiritual thing, or there's also interdimensional, extraterrestrial, and undiscovered animal, like monster stuff? Um, like I said, I got to ask I believe all are possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't Open-minded. see how an alien would bother using a conduit to communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, me, personally, um, I think that the whole dimensional thing is another way of labeling... The spiritual thing, the spiritual realm, uh-huh. me, because if you look at you look at anything in life, you know anything nowadays. People are recreating what's already been thought of. They're just giving it mm-hmm. a different name. You know they yeah. can't just leave more, it off alone. They could they want to sim- modify it and they want to change the title of it because mm-hmm. that gives them the um, elevated sense of accomplishment that I've just recreated. I've just recreated something that was yeah, like a more sophisticated way of explaining yeah. something. So modification is important. Yeah. Evolution of uh, intelligence and study is important, but um, you know, I, I think that's just another way people are labeling what's already been assumed exists. Okay, so then uh, from that, would you think that uh, the other fields of paranormal besides just spirits would be also spiritual, 
or would you think they have other uh, origins? You said you're open-minded to oh, the you idea. Mean like aliens? Or uh, like UFOs, um, any kind of being that people will talk to that's non-human? I, I, Tough I questions. Don't, I, don't, I don't think I view them as spiritual. Okay, so I you think there's... another type of entity. Yeah, multiple sources then? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, that's, I see what you, I see what you mean by that. Okay, I had to ask the hard-hitting questions while, while I was here, you know. Right. No, that's a problem. I, I, know, I, know what you're, I know what you're asking, though. <clears throat> so, no, I think that... You know, it's like, if you look at it this way, mankind's what experienced or investigated, if you will, like 5 or 6% of the oceans. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of ocean we haven't discovered yet. We're going through yet. Yeah. Likewise, you know, what the percentage would be with space beyond different galaxies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. It's one big frontier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I think. Because uh, I think when it comes down to it, no one's going to really know what's beyond the veil, as, as I would, the way I always like to put it, mm -hmm. until, you, until you pass on over. Mm -hmm. Anyone can. The great minds and scientists consider to speculate till, my opinion, the second coming or whatever. But you're still not going to know until yeah. you're over there. But it's fun. It's it, it's fun. It's interesting to rack your brain and try to try to figure out little questions and you know why does this happen and why do I hear footsteps in the middle of the night when everyone's asleep and. Mm -hmm. There's uh, different perspectives. Some think that it's like a non-intelligent sort of thing, mindlessly just uh, taking the same sort of uh, thing over and over again, doing the same sort of pattern. And I, think know, like both, UFOs, I, I think both exist. UFOs flying over the same areas, uh, the same kind of noises or something occurring in a given area. So some people think that it's um, you know, a mindless thing, and other people think that it, it's an intelligent thing. And some people think that it could be uh, two different types, like one mindless and one intelligent. So. I, I view residual separate from intelligent. Okay, so you're of the opinion that, it, that it's the two different things. There's the replay and then there's the actual intelligence. Yeah, and like the one thing that happened by some chance with the Annie thing yesterday, yeah. where she responded with the uh, pendulum, mm -hmm. and then ten seconds later, he goes and turns a flashlight out in Wellsburg, which is over an hour away. Mm -hmm. Well over an hour away. Okay. Know? And it could be coincidental. But I'm sorry, 10 seconds after the fact that we asked her to do that, then it happens, kind of bumps up the curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, then one time you watched a video of Finding Annie. Mm -hmm. We locked up and we were gone. No one was in that building. No one. No one would have got in. Because the way the camera was set up, we would have seen him come in. And it went off. And, yep. you know, it's just... I think Annie is one of the, the better stories about uh, a good intelligence, one of the, the better stories I've heard about a good intelligence. Now the new you know? one that we watched, or that we did uh, for Madison, we had a really good intelligent response too with that. Mm -hmm. And we, had a, we actually got an uh, EVP with that one too. Mm -hmm. So do you have a definitive perspective about where you think monsters come from, or are you just open-minded and unsure about where they come from, maybe different I'm places? I'm open-minded about it, because okay. I haven't mm -hmm. walked into their house, I haven't walked into the, you know, yeah. you know a okay. situation like that, about, you know, let's see. What about UFOs? Do you have a definitive where you think UFOs come from? Probably the X amount of percentage of space we haven't discovered yet. Okay, so the ET1? ET, ET hypothesis? Okay. Have you ever seen uh, feather crowns? I was just wondering, did you have like the morning jewelry? No. Uh-uh. Never, never. Have you ever heard of them? Is it like a wreath made of hair? It's like, um, you know how like... Most pillows used to be stuffed with feathers. They say oh, pillows. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Well, never mind. <laughs> they say that like um, whenever someone in the family was starting to get close to death, yeah, um, feathers would gather in the pillow to create like a crown. And when they died, they would rip the pillow open to check for the for the feather crown, and they huh. would keep the feather crown. And they would pe they would like check other people in the family's house, and they like other people in the family's pillows in the house. And they wouldn't have a feather crown. It's just a thing that would happen to people that were dying. We couldn't. They're pretty cool. I never heard of that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, our granny keeps uh, feather crowns and she keeps uh, hair, like locks from. Yeah, that's getting that stuff's getting hard to get now. And they just that and people just skyrocket the prices of wood and just ridiculous. Oh my god, I want it, but not that bad. <laughs> our granny still does stuff. Like that. That's awesome. <laughs> She's a little superstitious. Actually, lots of 
how do you use a pendulum? Like, what do you, you need a chain and like a, yeah, kind of like yeah. a light? You can buy them. In the what a lot of people do, the weight's right if you get like an old key mm -hmm. and just tie a piece of twine to it or something. See, like, um, we use when that. somebody in our family's pregnant, we'll thread a needle, put the needle through the head of an eraser on a pin, or like on a pencil, and we'll hold it over the belly. Yeah. I can't remember if it If it, if it goes like this. this. a little bit heavier. Well, I if can't it, remember if it's like, If it goes straight and forth, it's a boy. Something. And if it goes in a circle, it's a girl. Yeah, yeah. When I was little, I thought that was just like a cool trick you could do. I had no idea that that would be like a superstitious thing or anything like that. I, just thought, I didn't know that. I know they usually use it just for communication purposes. Yeah, our yeah. family's really superstitious. Though. I don't know where that comes from. But, um, <laughs> like, so, like, why does, why does it swing in a circle when you're not communicating? So you just moved a little bit. I saw you kind of twitch. You have to have a very steady hand. I don't know if I'll be able to I do it. I have really right. bad circulation, so I always I sit. And and sit he lays it on a like a, a I platform. I do a lot of drawing and painting. Like this. I think that's he lays it like I this. Do. Yeah. A lot of times it's like yes or no questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of like Ouija board or something like that. Similar. And you can lay them both there. That's what <laughs> How old are those Ouija boards? Those are probably sixties or seventies. Hmm. Do they have older ones that are like made of wood, or do people make those for themselves? I think they're, I think they're older ones. Hmm. Do you have any uh, weird coincidences with, in your life with the number 13? Because we do. <laughs> I don't know. Because, um... I know one thing that's always weird. Every, it never... It's more often than not, any time I look at a... My, like the clock in my car, mm -hmm. it's normally always nine nine one one nine eleven or whatever. <laughs> That's weird. More than I noticed any other typical number, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> then once in a blue moon, for like my receipt or something, if I buy something, it'll be like six dollars and sixty six cents change or what it costs me. That like, happens sometimes too. But, but I'm not very, I'm not very superstitious. Yeah, <laughs> I'm superstitious, but I think that's just because. Our family's superstitious, and I, I kind of like You've had it ingrained in you from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, with the number 13, uh, I was born August 13th. He was born August 13th. She's born July 13th. Cool. And our cousin was September 13th. Yeah. So. And our other cousin is June 13th. That's funny, because funny some of my more memorable things in history that I've studied, I didn't realize, like, the Shadowman picture was taken May 17th, 2004, and my birthday is May 7th. Hmm. I'm big into World War II, so um, allegedly um, Germany surrendered May 7th, 1945. Hmm. Um, one of the serial killers I always thought was interesting to study was H.H. H. Holmes, Mudgett. He was executed on May 7th. Hmm. There's a lot of cool little tidbits when you look hmm. at dates and stuff like that. Yeah. The Mothman legend has the number 13 a lot, like, because um, it was 13 months and it was the 13th steel pin eye bar on the Silver Bridge that caused the collapse. I remember, yeah, I remember hearing Also, um, you have a, a life cast of, um, uh, what's that director's name? Uh, um, what's the guy who did Psycho? What's his name? Hitchcock. Yeah, Hitchcock. He was born on August 13th. Oh, was he? And so was uh, the god Krishna. Okay. So there's a lot of that. It's pretty cool. Hitchcock's the man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, <laughs> one, he's one of my favorite uh, directors, him and Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick, yeah. I like what Hitchcock said, is any director can scare an explosion in 10 seconds. I'll show you the bomb and make way for 10 minutes. <laughs> he was so ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, I thought it was funny to give him all that turmoil and hardship of trying to make the movie Psycho, to where he had to take a lean against his house to produce it. Mm -hmm. and of course, once he once he does it, it's a big smash hit, and then like, oh, success, like we always knew it would be. He's like, yeah, sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, they were giving him a hard time because one scene showed a toilet. You know, where she <laughs> tears up that letter and flushes it for evidence? Yeah. They were giving him a hard time about showing a toilet. Yeah, Psycho is like one of the first um, horror movies to ever go inside like a, a shower. Like they never oh, show a bathroom yeah. in a, a movie before. So that's what he told the producers. Maybe we'll just go to France and shoot it in a bidet. <laughs> yeah. I never realized that. It's kind of... Yeah. It was 1960, and it was like the first slasher movie, really. Yeah, and now... And they said, we swear you're, you, sh you showed, you showed a... There's a we, sh we, we saw a breast. We, you showed a breast in the sequence. No, I suggested it. <laughs> Not once did it ever show anything like top, bottom, bad, or anything like that. Yeah. Well, Cause, you know why? Because he's a genius. That's why. <laughs> yep. 
got to see one of the last shows at Universal as a kid. We went down to to Florida, and before they took it out, they had the um, uh, Hitchcock 3D theater. And they took it out for Harry Potter. And, uh, you get to watch the birds in 3D. Of course, my grandmother's flipping out, but I thought it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> but I had a panic attack. So we didn't know you didn't like the movie Birds. <laughs> <laughs> was she scared of birds in general? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just a movie. The movie huh. terrified her as a, as a little girl. Yeah. So we didn't really know that. So we took her in and watched Birds in 3D. It didn't go well. In 3D. <laughs> Swatting at the air. I'm laughing. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, girl. We'll get you out of here. After the movie was over. <laughs> you were one of the, the tour guides. We went for the, the Moundsville when we did a night tour. Oh yeah. yeah. So, okay. so we've met you before. A lot of faces. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there definitely is. My sister talked about uh, like a gun that uh, uh, is in our family. That um, what, what? How many greats is it? Great, great, great. I think it's our great, great, great grandpa was murdered by. Um, yeah, it's sound familiar. Yeah, he was murdered by a, a man over a poker game, and um, he shot. The man that murdered him shot him, left him in the woods by a tree with the gun to try to make it look like he killed himself. But um, they ended up taking the man to the penitentiary here, and they executed him here. Um, but you know his name? We haven't. I haven't really gotten to look into it much. But my if grandpa. You, if you find his name, I'll have the picture. Yeah. Yeah, it's the second to last one that was yeah, killed by hanging. And it was in it was in Fayette County. Steed was executed just before Bud Peterson. Bud Peterson was last to be executed by hanging. Mm -hmm. So the mule Steed would be the second to last executed mm -hmm. by hanging. See, he I, was I 28. Was... He was black, male. He was a veteran. Murder, robbery, hanging. He was executed January 15th, 1948, Fayette mm -hmm. County. Would the robbery be because he took the gun? Well, it was over a watch. Oh, that's right. Game. So okay. stole the golden watch. Fayette County, too. So that's I just remember another thing I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you uh, if you'd ever studied Charles Fort or under understood the, the Fortean sort of thing. I'm not sure I've heard of that. Uh, Charles Fort was someone in like the 1920s. He would uh, spend time in libraries looking through different uh, old newspapers and medical journals and different things like that. And he would, uh, whenever he found something that was weird, uh, he termed it anomalous. Anything anomalous, he would write it down and mark it down. He would collect these stories and publish them himself. So he recorded anomalous phenomenon. And, uh, you know, people started calling those Fortean events. And people who study those anomalous phenomenons, uh, they uh, are called Fortians. Okay. So you ever heard of Charles Fort? No, I have not. Okay. I think he's like one of the guys, like the original <coughs> guys to use the word paranormal or to really investigate the paranormal. Okay. Or he, he didn't really investigate, but he assembled the, the stuff together, the anomalous stuff, and then uh, people investigated after him. And John Keel, the author of the Moffin Prophecies, he's one of my favorite guys. He was a Fortean. Okay. And um, like one of the things, you might have heard like, uh, like the raining frogs thing. Have you heard of that, that sort of event? Skyquakes? That's a Fortean event. Are you talking about like back in biblical times or? Um, no, like m there's modern reports. People report oh, okay. uh, frogs. <laughs> Just Charles Fort would find those in newspapers and he would collect them. And that was a, a thing in the, the 20s. And that's one of the roots of paranormal is that guy, Charles Fort. Okay. We'll look so, nothing to look into. Okay, I was gonna rattle off investigator names now <laughs> um, to ask if you knew them because I don't know how how involved you are with uh, talking to other paranormal like guys. Fort, like like a fort, right? F O R T. Uh, F -O -R -T yeah, fort. Okay. And Fortians are like Fort E A N. Oh, I, I've heard them talk about Fortians a lot. When yeah, at the Mothman and Festival, they talk a lot about Fortians. A lot of those guys are Fortians, so they just study anomalous phenomenon like. Uh, if you read up on Charles Fort and continued to study paranormal, they might consider you a Fortean. You know, if you, it means like a, pro a proponent of his ideas, basically. Okay. But yeah, ha have you never heard of a, other investigators call themselves that? Maybe you have. I just don't remember. I have not heard of that. Okay. How, how involved are you with uh, other investigators? Do you have a lot of investigator friends? Do you, yeah, yeah, we. Um, or some of the, the big big names that uh, 
big names that I'm that other people would know of. Good friends with uh, Chris Dedman. He's a demonologist. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio Gum. He's uh, trained to become an exorcist. He's a demonologist now. Hmm. Um, Harry Dolan in the guy's last name is Macaul Macaulay. He there with Demon Files. Hmm. Pretty decent friends with him. Uh, I think you said before you know David Weather Weatherly. Is yeah, that David one? Weatherly. Okay, he's kind of a, a bigger name. He's uh, someone who wrote a book about Mothman and stuff like that. Yeah. So well, his, he, I've seen him friend, at the festival. Mothman his festival. friends that I'm really close friends with is David Spinks. Hmm. Have he's you down around the center part of West Virginia? Have you heard of uh, Rosemary Ellen Golly? You have a, a book yeah. by her over there. Have you I, talked I to her? I met her once at the Mothman. She was really nice. Yeah, she's nice. I met her as well. I'm hoping to have her at my, one of my events this year coming up. Uh, how about the Frick brothers, John and Tim Frick? They're Mothman guys. They also do. That sounds familiar. John and Tim Frick. They. Uh, I don't think I know them. I might have heard the name in passing. Yeah, maybe at the festival or something. Yeah, they're they're yeah, pretty probably. involved in the Mothman thing. Uh, they're they were there for everything. They were there for the unveiling of the statue for the first Mothman festival. They're involved in all that. They're in documentaries. Not and a bad stuff. way to spend twenty thousand dollars. Yep. <laughs> they kind of had that kind of money laying around. Yeah, but, uh, the Frick brothers are cool, and uh, they do paranormal stuff, and they claim to be witnesses of paranormal stuff as well. Heck yeah. Um, I, I, I think I've heard that name. Okay, what about uh, Andrew Colvin? No. Okay. This is rattling off things. Are you fine? Uh, Lauren Coleman, he's one of the big crypto guys. I'm not... <coughs> I'm not real big uh, or up to date on... He's like the leading crypto guy. He has the Cryptozoology Museum. In Maine, Portland, Maine. That's, I did meet him. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's I, like I forgot his name because I got his, uh, his card. Yeah, he was really, really nice. Yeah, he's uh, he's got a board. Yes, he um, a board <laughs> I made. I made a a board um, of West West Virginia map, and I pinpointed all you know, like kind of like you have right there. Yeah. I, put, I pinpointed all the the Mothman sightings on it, yeah. and I'm tying together a string, and then I put listed out all the sightings, and uh, that I had that board hanging in my house, and I tweeted it out, and he asked me if I could send it to him for his uh, museum, oh, so I made a nice copy of it and sent it to him, so that's hanging in there in Portland, yeah. Maine. You should go up and see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Long drive. I like me. Oh, yeah. So this school that, you, that, that your setup's in, Yeah. when did they shut this down? 2009. How old is it? When did it begin? Well, originally it was open in 1909, <laughs> I believe. Is it the same that's building? Just, that's just from the double doors here. Mm -hmm. First and second floor down at just the corner. So that was built, you know, around 1908, 1909, I believe. Oh, so it's been redone since then? Well, all they did was add to it. Okay. So they added the side wing, the first floor behind us that loops around and comes back up this hallway to the stairwell and the gymnasium. That was put in the 1950s. Hmm. It started off, it was called the Third Street School. And then the first principal here was Miss Alice Sanford. So after she was forced to retire, I mean, she was a hard worker. Uh, they rededicated it in the 1950s as, Ms., as the Sanford, Sanford School hmm. mm -hmm. in her honor. Like 300 people showed up to it at the, dedica at, the, at the dedication. Yeah, I saw the video where you were going through the hallways trying to communicate with her and stuff. Yeah, we want to do that again. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to do a more often. So didn't again. you say you went here? Cameras now and didn't you say you went here when it was a school? I went through all six grades here, yeah. Cool. Hmm. What's it like uh, having a place in your old school? Interesting enough, but I never had a class in this room. No. <laughs> this would have been a fourth grade classroom. Man, it's a community center now? Is, yeah. it, is it still an active school? No, uh, well, community it's a community center, but it's, ironically, two of the rooms on the first floor on the, on the side wing are, uh, are a head start. So. Oh, weird. Yeah, I saw some on. kid toys outside. Why did they shut the school down? They consolidated. That's what I figured happened. Because it's a pretty nice looking school. And like That's out, sturdy. I mean, yeah. this is... You don't ever catch them on great. fire. It's brick, concrete, and rebar, and cinder block. I mean, yeah, I thought we had the wrong place. I was like, this looks too fancy to be a shut down school. Well, I'm on the I'm on the board of directors, so we we put a lot of money into it. Yeah, cool. We, um, it looks nice. Is it hard for people to, to find this place because they might think it's just a school, or do people find happened, it? Happened, but um, do you get a lot I of people? After a while, people realize once. Signs outside. You Facebook, they check out the website. Oh, yeah. So you get a lot of yeah. uh, people from your online presence. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we get a few from them. Yep. A lot okay. of times they come from the prison too. Oh yeah, because yeah. they, they see you as a tour guide. The prison being close by probably really helps. Yeah, that's the staple of tourism. Yeah. 
the count of them, and they get more uh, hmm. as many visitors as Ogilvy does. And Ogilvy's a big part. Yeah, Ogilvy's nice though. Yeah, it's real nice. Didn't the uh, the Paranormal Museum have a different location before? Yeah, down on uh, Jefferson Avenue, main drag. Hmm. What was the? the hot dogs? Yeah. Oh, she have a gym as well. Yeah, next door. Hmm. What was the the reason for moving it? They're just getting to be money pits. Hmm. And I was always worried because if one building caught on fire, then both would be gone. Yeah. Okay. So I was Makes sense. Nervous. Yeah. It's kind of hard to replace most of the stuff in here. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Each picture. That would be hard to replace. <laughs> yep. That's like basically a, a person uh, yeah. to you and your friends and people online. Um, I saw before when you guys did a live stream here. I like that you guys do live streams. I think it's really awesome. Uh, we started doing that because people really get into that. Yeah, I like when you guys live stream like a cemetery, just hanging out, talking in a cemetery or something like that. I like that. And plus, it, it means that people can watch and not know know that you're not editing it and just see the yeah. the stuff as it happens. You know? Okay, I want to thank you for well, answering was, all my questions and stuff and talking that, with us. You know, what, what you're doing with your channel, what we're doing with our channel, it's history. You know, yep. It's history being documented. It, it, it needs to happen or else no, or no one would do it. Mm -hmm.